Good morning. Today is Thursday, December 10th. The special convened meeting of the Kentucky High School Athletic Association is now in session. First item of business is our COVID-19 response. Uh, Mr. Collins. Thank you, President Billings. As the board is aware, uh, pursuant to KRS 156-070, the KHSAA is the designated agent of the Kentucky Board of Education to administer interscholastic athletics. As such, the association is considered a quasi-state agency and because the state board's promulgation of 702 KAR 7065, all meetings of the association are required to be conducted as open meetings under KRS 61.800 through 850. During the COVID-19 pandemic, state and federal states of emergencies, as well as the governor has declared states of emergency and required social distancing. As such, this meeting is being held via teleconference and broadcast over the internet. This is in accordance and consistent with Senate Bill 150, Attorney General Opinion 20-05, and state law as it is not feasible to offer a primary physical location for the meeting, which the, which the general public can attend. As this is a special meeting of the board, we are focused on the items that have been called on the agenda for the duration of this meeting. Thank you. Daryl's muted. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, we are do want to welcome everyone on, on our Zoom call. We've got several folks across the Commonwealth on our Zoom call, as well as a couple of board members. Uh, most of us are here in person, uh, but we welcome you and hope uh, this thing goes uh, quickly and, and painlessly. Uh, at this point in time, I'll take a motion to go into closed session to discuss legal matters. Make a motion. Motion by Greg, seconded by Pete. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your right hand. At this time, we'll go into a, a closed session. Welcome back. And uh, as we come out of a, a uh, closed legal session, there was no action taken by the board pursuant to the KRS. Item number three for today's special meeting, recognition of outgoing advisory members. Hey, Rob, what? Well, you adjust it. Okay, good, we're adjusted. Just wanna make sure that echo, we're having, like, I, like I told other members earlier, um, we're having a little bit of an echo because we're trying to have remote members and in-person members. Uh, we just want to be sure and, and publicly thank the board members who have rolled off the board and yet have continued serving as advisory members for these very difficult six months. Uh, a number of them will still be involved. I will involve them in a, in a special group that we're going to have. Uh, I will involve several of them in a special group that we're going to have that's going to help us with the finance issue. Uh, related around our, our office. Uh, that will obviously be a group that starts work and then uh, helps report back to the full board uh, it's, as we start looking at the financial implications and ramifications of not only our, the, the repayment of our loan or our PPE grant, our PPP grant, uh, but also as we start looking at long-term financial options. And we will involve those people. I, I, I just think it's... Uh, probably not very wise for us not to use all that experience and combine it with the experience that's on our board now and make the best decisions we can. But certainly uh, all of them have gone the extra mile uh, to help us. We would like to plan on, let's, let's, uh, let's all plan by the time we have a, a recognition in May uh, for outgoing board members potentially this year, we'd like to roll them in with that as well and just have a celebration of those people who've given so much time and talent but we certainly want to thank them uh, for their efforts. I know they didn't plan when they rolled off the board, maybe on having 47 Zoom meetings uh, since the last part of June, but uh, we do. And we had, uh, we had said all along, we would try to utilize them through the end of the calendar year. And I want to publicly on behalf of the staff, thank them for their help 
uh, their consultation and their wisdom, uh, but understand that unless they change their cell phone number, we're still going to be calling them. So uh, I don't know if any of the rest of you have any commentary, but I just want to thank them uh, for helping us get through this, get through this, this segment, as we've said all fall, of a very difficult school year. We do want to thank all three of them, uh, Jeff, Reed, and, and Donna for, for, for their service. And I'm sure we'll all be in touch very soon. And Reed, I know you're here with us today in person, but thank you for, you know, they came from Pikeville, from Muhlenberg, and from Estill. They came from all over the state. So we certainly appreciate that help as well. And we appreciate also, and I know you and I have talked about this, Mr. President, we appreciate Mike who had a mid, mid-year uh, change of, of status and decided he was going to do what a lot of us want to do, which is maybe take a moment to relax, uh, but certainly appreciate Mike helping us out these last couple of meetings. Remember, we've got an ongoing election for a non-public school member that should be done the end of uh, December. And about same time, we'll be putting out nominations to replace those that go off the board this year. So it's a rather constant cycle. And uh, we appreciate those three that have given the whole time. Of course, Mike was here as a board member for the first part and then finished up the last couple of meetings helping us out. But, but we certainly uh, thanks uh, as well as, uh, I guess I guess we have two different clubs this year. Uh, we have the three that rolled off and then we have two that found retirement too enticing to, to uh, miss. So we also thank Bonnie uh, for her help. I know that uh, her, uh, she and John have always been very close to the association, just like the rest of these former board members. And, and we just really appreciate their efforts to keep us informed and keep every region, uh, keep that information going. I know the, the members that have overlapping regions with current members have spent a lot of time talking to each other. And they're, I think we probably had better orientation transferring between regional reps than we ever had just out of necessity because of all this uh, COVID stuff. So been really good. But again, I think we all thank them. Don't know if anybody else had anything before I turn it back over to you, Mr. President. They will be sorely missed. Uh, but uh, as, as always, as in the five years I've been here, uh, once you've been a member or a part of this group, you, you kind of maintain some continuity from now on. And, and we look, definitely look forward to those relationships continuing. Item number four, COVID-19, our special meeting. Item 4.1, the review of data from the health department and other information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, President. I, I wanna point to some information. You have had uh, some of this before, but I wanna be sure that, that it, it factors into your thinking, whether or not it factors into your decision. Uh, the first attachment on the meeting is, is our chart that we first started looking at in the summer that shows our overlap and participation between coaches and players when seasons cross over. We have a very difficult set of decisions this morning, and this is but one factor, uh, but it is something for us to keep in mind. We gave you graphically the, the overlap between uh, people that play fall sports and winter sports and people that play winter sports and spring sports. And so it's, it's important that we, we know that, that where those counts actually lie. It may be that we have to accept the fact that the pandemic means we can't be perfect. There is not going to be a Solomon-like solution where you're gonna look down and see, boom, here it is. But one of the factors that I've asked you all to keep in mind, and you have kept in mind through all of your discussion, is the overlap between seasons. Where possible to protect that. Where not possible, it's not possible. And we're going to talk about some of those not possibles this morning. But I just want to be sure that you, you know that that is still in the forefront. And it's for both coaches and participants. The other set of data, and this is all just information. There's no action expected on this item. We do have a copy of the two orders, that uh, the governor's orders, uh, 2020-968 and I believe 969. Uh, both of those orders impact what we do. Uh, one, of course, was the order mandating the shutdown of schools, which has been litigated and will likely continue to be at some point. And then the other was a, a closing down of indoor activities. And you may not think the restaurants and bars shutdown affects the KHSAA. 
but in fact, it indirectly does with all of our member schools and any of our event concession stands, et cetera. But in that order directly impacted is our sport activity of bowling uh, because there are some very strong limits in there. Now, as of now, that, that order is set to expire, I believe the 13th. There's lots of rumors on the street as far as uh, renewal in a different number, non-renewal, et cetera. We do not know what the order will contain and have not been told what the order might contain on bowling alleys. They were impacted in two ways. Uh, first of all, they were impacted uh, by the, the percentage of occupancy limitation. And despite the number of people that we have in a bowling alley for our state tournament, I'll just say that those numbers we have probably exceed what they're supposed to have for that period of time. Uh, some of you that have been to that event know that is a well attended event and an exciting event. The, the, the indoor limit also impacts with that, impacts the number of competitors they can have and even gets down as specific as to how far apart they need to be. So our staff has been closely monitoring that. We know that there's very little activity going on uh, through this week at least in those venues. And so there certainly has not been an option for, for our winter sport activity of bowling to get going. The second piece that impacts bowling alleys in a totally different way, and this is all data we're being given. So uh, I'm not a bowling proprietor and neither is our staff that assigns it, but they do keep in touch with those proprietors. And it is also dramatically impacted, the food limitations dramatically impact these bowling alleys. They don't, they can't keep the lights on and keep all that machinery running for a dollar a game. But they can with what they sell at restaurants and what they sell at, at bars and et cetera. So they're uh, not during our matches on the bars, by the way, but their, their livelihood has been tremendously impacted here. So we are communicating with them every day uh, and communicating with facilities on what it looks like when they open up and it's a capacity change. And that will drive a lot of our final determinations on schedule. And we will keep you informed. There will not be an opportunity unless you all deem it necessary to conduct a board meeting to talk about the bowling schedule. Because I think if you resolve today's issues on basketball, it's gonna solve a lot of our other issues. But I do think it was uh, our job to tell you what all was going on. Sarah is our Sarah Bridenbaugh is our contact with that. Sarah, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it pretty well. I might add that in that order, it also prohibits. Hang on. Remember, those of you remote need to wait till we tell you because we got to turn the speaker up in here. Are we good, Mr. Catherine? Thank you, Sarah, if you don't mind. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me now. So. Um, the, the only thing I would add is that the order also um, prohibits team practices. <laughs> Um, or competitions right now. So they're not doing leagues either. Um, there are very few of our bowling alleys even open currently um, until they see where this executive order comes before the 13th. So um, uh, that would be the only thing I would add. Thank you, Sarah. And I would add that this was the only sport or sport activity directly impacted by those two orders because they defaulted to the KHSAA for everything else. But because of their prohibition on bowling teams and other activity, it, it ended up catching us in this particular order. It was a short term order. Uh, I, you know, I can tell you as we go further, we'll talk a little bit about the concerns about indoor events, but certainly this is something that that we just need the board aware of as we go forward because uh, you may hear from constituent groups. The next attachment that, uh, that is a public health uh, attachment, I, I, we saw this, I sent you all an article last week um, that was out of the American Academy of Pediatrics and it talked about the value uh, and the encouragement and really push to get our students back in schools. We believe that that dovetails in and includes uh, their involvement with activities uh, that go on after school. We don't believe there was a separation in that finding, but the American Academy of Pediatrics got a very good article about that. In addition to that, there is considerable concern being expressed, and I sent you all an article from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. I happen to have also seen that on several of your local uh, boards of education or school districts websites. And it is really about the the mental issues and anguish, et cetera, that's going on among our students 
with the on and off and on and off again of everything. And I don't think that's restricted to class. Uh, I certainly think that what we saw our fall sports go through has impacted people. I know that when we had people that were shut down, running, shut down, running, there we've had a lot of feedback about that. And we've got a, a group out of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, that's doing some survey data collection and trying to see. I think we're all going to find that uh, there's no doubt from a mental health perspective, we're better with those 18 and under people being back with their peers somehow. And, and that's got to weigh into your decisions uh, at, at some point. So I want to be sure and make sure you saw that article. Um, we've had some questions and, and I will, if you don't mind, I'd like to spend a little time on this attachment. Um, we've had some questions about finances that have come up again recently. And, you know, normally we have been blessed because a lot of the things that, that you have approved that staff has proposed over the years uh, have led us to a financial security where we were, we were pretty well able to uh, just keep on keeping on. And as long as we manage things aggressively, we were able to continue performing. I've had uh, a specific set of questions about uh, a summary. So I, I share with you a one page document. It is not intended to give you everything about the KHSA, uh, but it is a one page summary that comes off of our working budget. So we have two different documents that you have attached uh, that are part of our normal spring meeting and, and orientation. And we really drill down through it. And then the rest of the time it's internal to our use. We're monitoring everything all the time. We give you at every meeting and you approve all expenditures as well as a look at our balance sheet. So that checks and balances has worked very well, but I thought this summary might help with some of the questions that, that, that you were asking. The association divides its revenue into three basic areas. Uh, and this is strictly to put it on a spreadsheet. And that is that first document that is attachment. Be sure I've got the right number. Uh, it's an attachment to 4.1 and it says financial capsule. Just so you see that. Are we okay with that? Okay. Because this is a quick and dirty summary. I found with our calendar demonstrations that while it's good to graphically show examples, it's harder to explain. So I just wanted to kind of give you a real quick look. These are 2018-19 and 2017-18, which are our two last full years of operation. And nothing substantial operationally changed in 1920 pre-COVID. So I just want to show you this. Total administrative and other revenue, there's a number of line items, but the bottom line is membership, advertising, video, and some other revenue. Uh, membership comes in at between three and four hundred thousand dollars based on the due structure we have now. And 90 percent or more of that goes right back out to pay the insurance premiums for catastrophic insurance, liability insurance, and all of that. That is strictly our schools, while they consider it dues, and I respect the fact they consider it dues, the bottom line is it's a volume insurance discount purchase because they certainly could not get it at that price buying it on their own. And that is the catastrophe insurance. That's the $25,000 deductible up to several million, six, 7.5 million this year. Uh, if we do have a catastrophic injury, we hope there's never a claim. And I know that the Roberts guys do too, but the last couple of years, you can see that that approach is about 700,000 in revenue. And that's pretty predictable. Now, over 675 is predictable. All right, so let's go to the next one. Special programs revenue. Hall of Fame, uh, middle schools, sportsmanship, the officials division and corporate partners. And you can see that the last two years before last year, we had pretty good years in those. Our registration of officials has been declining. Our corporate sponsorships have been treading water. Our Hall of Fame revenue's actually gone up a little bit. Middle schools are listed as a line item there, but there is no revenue yet. We have not reached consensus with the middle school committee on any kind of revenue stream. Um, but we, we have reached consensus on a number of services they would like, but not at this point have we been able to finance them. And then playoff revenue. So as you can see, 60, 60 plus percent of our total revenue comes from playoffs. Uh, that is the, the championships we conduct in the 18 or 19 sports and sport activities. 
uh, those have matching on that on that big sheet that's got all the detail. You will find matching totals for other expenses. Uh, the other expenses get into uh, travel, the board, contract services, legal services, PD, physical plant, which this is a big building that takes a lot to operate, and equipment and the insurance purchases that we talked earlier about. We take in the money from the schools. We've got to pay it out. For school administrators that are looking at their own budgets, our percentage of, of outlay for payroll for our 14 person staff is about 24. Where I know in most school districts, that number is a little bit higher. It probably approaches 80 or 90, but we have a different level of personnel. We only have 14 people. So 25% of that uh, is about what it costs to keep personnel involved. And then the total expenses, and you can see the last two years before last year, we were able to show a profit. Now, when we talk about events and you start talking about overlapping events and start talking about potentially hurting events, I want you to look at the last two years of net revenue for our championship. This is not gross. This is not the 1.1 or $1.2 million uh, for the boys basketball tournament because it's the gross. This is what we take home, okay? Um, you can tell that the archery and those activities um, do not, uh, they're not a drain. They are not a negative expense, but they're also probably not going to contribute much to your year round operations because all of these things together have to combine to keep a building running and keep a 14 member staff providing services to the member schools 12 months a year. And in most cases, 24 seven, at least it has been lately. You can look, I highlighted in yellow, the events we lost revenue from last year totally. So it cost us $48,000 for the baseball tournament to be canceled. That's net dollars, that's not gross. Now the question might come up for you, why did the net, why did the revenue change so much over those two years? When we went back to a semi-state tournament, the revenue went up significantly. So going from 16 to eight changed our revenue in a good way. But that question may come up with people that have questions. Fishing pays for itself. Fishing and golf are two that I wanna point out to you that when you look at 17, 18 compared to 18, 19, it appears as though there's been a significant decline. It's not necessarily totally accurate because when we hired L Marketing to do our marketing services for us, the sponsorship money around those events went into that other administrative category versus getting credited specifically to the sport. So the net to the association budget is the same, but when you do year to year lookups, you're gonna see a slight difference. So we really didn't spend $6,500 more on golf and boys than we took in. We just don't have the $7,500 or $7,000 from the title sponsorship included. Does that make sense? We have it included somewhere else, but we don't have it included in the golf revenue. And that's $7,000 for boys and $7,000 for girls. And when you look at those, those uh, when you look at those two events, when you add those back in, obviously girls golf has less expenses than boys. And then we also have additional money from the sponsor that goes towards sponsorships, uh, which is technically and legally restricted. And that's the last thing that I'll mention today. Then we lost our net revenue off the boys and girls basketball tournament. These are the numbers I've been sharing with anybody that would listen that may have uh, an opportunity for us to try to get back some of what we lost. Uh, the net loss for basketball for last year is about $840,000 if you compare it to the year before by not having the basketball tournament with unlimited attendance, et cetera. That's a, that's a big loss. In fact, last year's limit was zero. And then it's another $125,000 for the girls when you just compare the year before. Could have been even better if the draw works out right. You don't know what that amounts to. Then you see the bowling competitive cheer. Competitive cheer is a big event for us. Now we did have, I believe in 1819 was our first year of a price change, but that was because we had a significant cost change uh, at our mm -hmm. venue. So just so you recognize that there's reasons for the deviation. An example of what the COVID is doing to us, uh, the 
net revenue from cross country for a year ago or not 18, 19 was about $39,000 net. That's higher than the gross for this year with all the attendance limits. So, you know, if, if this were McDonald's, you'd be looking to try to figure out what sandwich or location you need to close. But we are the only people providing this service. So we have to, we'll continue to have to find a way. Our football playoffs in 1819, the net revenue after we paid all the fees involved with hosting uh, was $196,000. The year before that was 350. In case you've forgotten why, I believe on every snap of the football in 2018, it was raining. A matter of fact, we ended up postponing games because of lightning during that weekend. So, you know, outdoor events, while they help you with social distancing, they certainly are hampered by weather. So you need to see that, you need to know that. Um, soccer, again, a change in the semi-state format made our comparison between 1819 and 1718 positive. We don't, I don't back down from the fact that when we run these events, we are trying to generate revenue because that's going to provide income for the rest of the year's operations. I'll back down from that. And I, I'll, I'll say another thing here in a second, but tennis tournament, you see the comparison track and field has done very well. So we lost effectively, it's, it's a million 50 to, a, to 1.1 with the cancellations of the highlighted events. This is an organization that going into last year had a cash reserve, including restricted money of a little over a million. It's not hard to see why revenue drives a lot of our thinking around here. Two things that we need to make sure that everybody knows, and I know you all know in this room, not one dollar that's been talked to you about today comes from the Kentucky State Treasury. Not one. There is no tax allocation. There is no funding allocation, et cetera. There also is no other source of revenue. There's no other, there's no pocket that money's hidden in. There's no special account hidden. This is it. We do have multiple bank accounts for security reason, reasons. And we have a couple of accounts where money is kept because it is legally restricted. For example, we did receive about $400,000 from the PPP program. We are, if you remember, we were one of the first institutions approved. They continued all summer to change the rules on that program. And a good deal of that loan, matter of fact, as, as high potentially as 50%, may have to be repaid back or converted to a loan. Until we have it audited and we have you approved last meeting to engage our audit firm and they will work with our bank. But until we're audited, that entire amount is to be considered restricted. So when you look at the balance sheet report and you see that there's X number of dollars on it, you ought to immediately subtract $400,000. Because right now we've got to consider the PPP money a liability that has to be paid back. And then we'll see how much of it is forgiven. And I can tell you that, that we have been advised and we have the best nonprofit auditing firm, I would say not only in the city, but the state. They are outstanding. But we have been advised not to be in a hurry to seek forgiveness because they're continuing as part of the ongoing negotiations for CARES Act and other funding. And in the middle of our transition in Washington, they're continuing negotiations. We don't know where it's gonna land. They have encouraged us to keep the brake pedal on the forgiveness stuff. Several state associations uh, applied for the eight week forgiveness because it was last summer and now are being advised to reapply because there's already been changes going on with those. So we're watching that. Um, remember the basic tenant of the PPP money was you were borrowing to protect your payroll so that the office staff could continue working and so that payroll taxes could continue being paid, which helps government. Okay, so it was a good trade-off here. Well, while that's important for the revenue side, understand we also have a number of other people that we pay, uh, including our assigning secretaries in sports. We are in an odd position. Most people 
will will not be able or will likely not be able to include payments to contractors in their PPP forgiveness. But our payment to contractors is mandated by a federal court order that requires us to have assigners. So our lawyers go get some fun work when our auditors get done with their report because I would contend we will fight that that is, that is money that we should be able to count as payroll. If we prevail in that argument, we may not have any that, that doesn't get forgiven because it's a, it's a good amount. It's, uh, it's not as much as our payroll, but it's close. We pay around a million dollars to contractors each year. And only a little bit of it goes to our Title IX part-time retired staff. The rest of it goes to our signers. Passes through us, goes to our signers. Technically, those assigners were able to, to apply for PPP money. That's the argument we're going to hear from the federal government. Flip it, I don't know how they could apply when we were paying them. So, because they're not going to be able to justify the loss in income. So, this will, ours may be tangled up for a while. And that's why the, the money stuff is important uh, to frame for you all. Now, is there anything else about the, the revenue from an, any event? about the expenses from any event, is there any other questions that we can address so we can summarize the reporting here? And please, if staff, uh, I know I had, I have a, several staff that are not comfortable in group settings right now. They've chosen to attend via Zoom. And uh, if they, but they're all on, they're available to you. If any of them have questions, raise a little raise hand icon. Rob, I think being 20 feet from everybody socially distanced enough, you've done good. But uh, is there anybody that has questions about the financial implications, et cetera? Uh, there we go. All right, uh, Commissioner Taggett, thank you for that report. And uh, well, it's uh, very eye opening. Uh, what I would just want to say is that this organization provides a tremendous experience for our students of the state of Kentucky. And, you know, we are you know, at, at, in trouble here financially. Uh, I think it's time that we uh, talk to our legislators and we're gonna need some help to provide the services that are so valuable to our kids, our schools and our parents. And we're gonna need that help, I, I think, to because, you know, we don't know what this looks like moving forward uh, and what events we can have in some of our biggest events uh are in jeopardy of helping out and i just i just feel like it's time that we i don't know in the future I, i've not been a part of this two or three years but i think it's time that we uh, have to say we're gonna need some help uh for the experiences of our kids this, this organizations you know never ask for anything and runs on its own and done a great job but uh our backs against the wall right now and uh you know if if we're about kids in the state of kentucky not just this organization but <clears throat> everywhere then then we i think we need some help uh, and, go, and going to need some help to, to make this work for our, our kiddos. I will say this uh, publicly. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I think for a number of years, um, I have personally been since 1992, the person that goes over and deals with the legislature and state government, whether regardless of what my role was here, that was what I was asked to do. Uh, we have prided ourselves on never need anything, including 1994 when we just about went bankrupt when this building was built. And our member schools stepped up, helped us uh, pay off a bond uh, for the building. And now we are, and we never missed a blink on, on services. I think it is pretty evident, regardless of your political leanings, it is pretty evident that this board has fought for student opportunities all year long made some very challenging decisions and those opportunities at some point have had to be paused and at some point have had to go on fast forward but it's all been because of opportunities for students uh, we've tried to recognize and prioritize um, what the student needs first and what adults feel like secondary but i think you are exactly right mr smith and, and i will say that from an administrative standpoint i don't I never talk about myself, but I'm, I am leveraging those 28 years of walking those hallways right now with various people, whether they're in the executive branch 
or the legislative branch. And I am, and I've been around this game a little bit. I am not for one minute worried about requests that might be made in exchange. I'm not for one minute worried. It's more important for us to go forward. Because the reason I say that is because while others may feel like we don't wanna be beholden or don't wanna do this, the, the greater good has to prevail. And I think we can also demonstrate that over the years when they have come to us with legislative issues, we have worked hand in hand with them to resolve them. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's been health and safety, if it's been a desire for us to look at our eligibility rules and modernize them based on what constituents have said, whatever it has been, we have been at the table whenever offered a seat. Because I found out when I first started going over there, one of my predecessors was struggling with the purchase of this building and was struggling with legislative reaction to some things he had done I found out that if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And we have therefore insisted, uh, we forced our way to the table. We have both groups listening. We are in line with thousands of other groups, restaurants and business and everybody else that have had trouble. We know that. We have been given assurances that we will be considered for anything that's eligible for us to be considered for. And they'll ask for, for whatever we need to provide them in documentation. We haven't been guaranteed a thing. We have to blindly go forward as though we're gonna to have to survive. We know we have financial options that a lot of people don't have. We have a building that's paid for and real estate in this town is overpriced for business real estate. It is available both for a loan against it and potentially for the sale and reduce. We've also talked to one of our, of our partners about potentially jointly looking at space because both of us need to curtail some of our expenses on space. That We don't know where that'll land. Unfortunately, dealing with student athlete participation 24 seven and a staff of about six executives, uh, it, it, we've had to prioritize timing. So I suspect after the first of the year, um, you'll see this get more aggressive. I know that even as late as this morning, with one of the legislative uh, leaders on the Senate side, I again made the mention of the fact that we're going to be coming. If it's short term, if it's a grant, if it's whatever. The challenge with real estate transactions is as you've already seen, in general, our operations pay for itself through the year. What are you gonna generate that's gonna pay your real estate costs? Whether it's payments on a loan, or, or whatever, you then get into, at some point, your member schools are gonna to have to decide how much they value your services. That's what happened in 1994. They said, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna cuss about it and fuss about it till it's paid off, but we know our representatives are doing the best thing possible. So uh, I, it's a long answer, Curry, but I felt like it was necessary to get out there. And just one more comment. I know this is, this is probably not gonna be very popular, uh, to say, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, we have about 270 member schools. Is that correct, Commissioner? How many members? 283. 283. Uh, and no one ever wants to talk about raising dues, but we're in a pandemic. And uh, if it means that we had to do something like that to save staff, now we're talking about a million, some dollar shortfall possibly, but if we're talking about some decisions we have to make later today that could affect staff, our members are asking us to play. They're asking us to do things. And I don't think it's too much of an ask to go back and say, uh, if we do this, we might have to increase your membership by 50% or maybe a, I think we pay a thousand. Send me a bill for 2000. Now, everybody might not feel that way and that's okay. I don't care. I'm fine. But you can't ask for one thing and not sometimes have to do something that's a little more difficult. And so I'm not talking about forever, but during this pandemic, if for one year that we need to increase that to help with you know, our financial status, I think that's not a bad ask either. So well, I can tell you that at a, po at a point in time in the 90s, when our dues was $125 and we went to 1400 for our biggest school, we were the highest dues generating state association. We are now about the fourth lowest because we, other than a three year ago adjustment, 
uh, we have made no adjustment. Everybody can keep on keeping on. And what a number of states do, and this is really, this is not for today, but it is a financial background information. We are one of the very few states that does not charge per sport in addition to an administrative fee. Now the risk, what they're experiencing now is when they decide not to have a sport, that's money the state association doesn't get. So that's not the, the best long-term alternative. But if people could project and people could budget and you knew that you were gonna still get catastrophic insurance, you were gonna do that, it is a reasonable request. We could go the other way as we've uh, had previous discussions about some of these big benefits like the insurance, we could hand back to the schools but that's not a wise move for the schools because they won't be able to get that purchase. Whatever your district student size is, I don't think you can get the cat policy for $4 a head for that kind of seven and a half million dollar coverage. I don't think so. So, uh, you know, I, it's a good package. That's why I mentioned earlier when we thanked our, our board members going off, uh, our, our advisory, advisory members, members. Some, some of those seven, seven eight years experience knowing the ins and outs will be combining with, with you all and. We're gonna really have to dissect our options. And we've got to not worry, whatever comes out because of the pandemic, we gotta not worry about perception. Well, we don't wanna be in debt. We don't wanna be debt, we wanna be debt free. You know what? We, we wanna be open. We wanna be open for business, helping students and, and schools, and then let's go to Howard. Anything else on the financial side? I have a question for school I just want to say, Thank you. Uh, the superintendent may be able to ask this, uh, answer this for me. Uh, with the CARES money that's been made available to you, is that money available to use, uh, for example, in dues? Uh, can that money be used in something that, that aids in assisting? Your, I guess it could be tied to insurance. I guess my question for superintendents is, is that a possibility for some of those funds? Well, I, let me tell you what I know from about 75 superintendent calls this year. It would involve a shift within the district. That can only be spent on specific things, but it's possible what was previously appropriated for those specific things could go to help do so. But the CARES money is really rigid. As a matter of fact, I think the superintendents got noticed last week that some of the anticipated things they thought the federal money was going to cover, there was a, a little do-over by the federal government for a lot of uh, PPE supplies, I believe. I think Lucy and Mark yeah. were on. I just, I just wanted to say thank you for giving us that report. I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. And I think sometimes when people are being critical and complaining, they, it's because they don't understand the facts. And so I'm sure there's lots of people that didn't really understand all that's involved as far as the finances. And so I think this was very helpful. Um, it's not just about the money, which, you know, we may hear some people see, but we have to have the money in order to provide the services for the students. So I appreciate you sharing that with everybody to, to, to let everybody know. Yeah, um, you know, this is my seventh year on the board and you, you learn a lot as time goes on. And one of the things you learn about is finances. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked when I'm out in the communities and all and and hear people do this or criticize or i mean they talk all the time and uh, i'm shocked at the number of people out there that you would think they can be principals they can be presidents they can be a lot of different things uh, they can be coaches but i'm shocked that so many of them have no idea they think that we are funded by the state they have no idea in the world that the only way we make our money to pay for the things that we bring to these kids is through our, our championship events uh, most of them have no idea that most states take the money out of the districts. They take the money out of the regional tournaments. We don't, and uh, and we give it back to our schools. So, so you know, I, I think that was very important to get that across because people just need to understand the service we do for these kids, the championships that we bring to these kids, pretty special, and uh, and we do it standing alone. Um, with that being said, you know, I, I think that. We have a lot of decisions to make today, and, and, and I think we need to strongly keep in mind what we've just talked about, because when I, when I, you know, everybody in this room that, and everybody's been to state championship events, we get back in, you know, in our next meeting and those things are over with, and we look at our, we look at our assistant commissioners and our staff, and we, we thank them, we come back, how fantastic that was done. Um, 
And it was. And a lot of times they have multiple events on the same weekends and they do a tremendous job. And I always wonder, first of all, I would never want the job. Um, Julian would be hard to deal with. I'm just kidding about that. But but on the on a serious note, you know, when we talk about our situation here and you start talking about cutting this staff potentially because of that, I think we just need to do what we have control of to make sure that we give Julian every opportunity to do what he needs to do to be able to keep everybody that we have right now, because in my opinion, we're understaffed anyway. So if we want quality, we have to put our money where our mouth is. And I think we need to think about that all day today. Thank you, Mr. Evans and, and Ms. Moore for your comments. I, I, will, I will address two things that Mark said, just to make sure the full board, uh, both on Zoom and, and on uh, in the room are aware. We are the only state that we're aware of that postseason revenue stays 100% with the schools until our state tournament. Um, neighbors of ours take in 100% of that postseason revenue. Some of them, one of our neighbors to the Northwest takes in, they, they, the state gets 2% of their first round and 100% of the rest of it. And then they dole out some allowances. We believe that in our small state, as far as population goes, the reason athletics has played such a prominent role is that that money recirculating back through the schools allows them to have teams that they may not otherwise have. You are seeing right now on the landscape of the co of colleges, the dropping of non-revenue sports. And they callously call them non-revenue at that level because they're basically saying, if you can't pay for yourself, we're cutting you. Well, in most schools, we have several non-revenue sports. Now, when you look at our state numbers, we can generate finances but a local school district struggles to have events that will pay for tennis teams and cross country teams and other things. They might be able to do a uniform fundraiser, might be able to do something like that, but they're constantly hitting people up because their events can't generate that. These other states don't have that problem. They are able to generate by, the by one of our neighbors to the Northeast just being able to have football this year. They have been able, I believe I was told that their, their office took in a million dollars the first week of their playoffs. Uh, and just because of the way their revenue, we, we've never done that. One of the things we've had to change for this year, and frankly, given the landscape of things, I don't see this changing this year. We have had to remove the expense reimbursement for teams going to our team state tournaments. Hate that. Hate that. Because I hate for somebody to stay three nights instead of four, or four nights instead of the other way around, three nights instead of four, because they're not getting reimbursed. But right now, the doors staying open have to be priority. If at the end of the year, we've gotten some money from somewhere, let's go back, do it. But, but the lion's share of the state associations don't reimburse those expenses yet. We've, our schools have had it pretty good. They've been able to keep their district and region money and keep their, and get something back for state tournament. Now, I know every, every one of you in here that's been to a state tournament, have not profited because the bandwagon gets pretty full, but at least you had something coming. I hate the thought of a team coming from the central time zone to football next week, and we're not going to pay, pay expenses, but you know what? It's a pandemic, which is you, you told us all along and they certainly told you all with 10,000 emails. We want to play. Okay. You gave them that. So, you know, they're, they're, it's just, we're going to have some tough calls to make, but I, I really, that, that notation of the other states is, is really important for us to keep in mind. I, I have been here a while. I like the way the money recirculates back, but I also like being able to have competent staff. We get a survey every year of what the other state associations compensation is. Thank heavens for one of our neighbors to the direct east, because otherwise every one of our neighboring states is much better compensated on those positions. But you know what? I haven't had anybody come to me in 11 years since I changed jobs or 25 plus before and say, if I don't get more money, I'm leaving. This group, this group that we've got working in this office prides themselves on the comments Mark just made. The people, they are dead dog. By the end of the second week of basketball, they are the tongues are wagging wrapped around. And they may not have had that big a role in managing it, but they've been there every second. And they've been working with it, and they've been trying to keep you happy and trying to keep the teams happy and trying to keep the fans happy. 
But you know what? When you all walk up to them and say, great job on that, all of a sudden there's wind in their sails. And that's what they, that's the only reward you get here. So I think we, we have to keep that in mind. Mark's right. You know what we really need, especially as we start thinking about a couple of people leaving here, we need somebody on the finance side, maybe a part-time position. We could certainly gonna to have to restructure our marketing. We, we, could, we could use somebody else. Uh, we could actually use a second technology person because of the diverse duties that our technology person has taken on. But we can't do that. So we've cut it down. People don't understand when Ms. Mitchell retires, we are not replacing that position. Her position will be assumed by a person in the office who's going to pick up a little extra work. And we know she's young, got broad shoulders, and we're going to put that work on her. But we have, we have cut staff. We cut $100,000 worth of part-time staff the day we shut down the basketball tournament. We haven't had them back. Hate that. Because we had three part-timers on top of that. We have an unfunded mandate. I know we're not supposed to say that and be politically correct, but we have an unfunded mandate here that came through regulation where we have to provide Title IX education and information for our schools. That cost is $100,000 a year, 80 to 100,000. We suspended that for the spring and on into this fall. Some people around the table, I doubt anybody around this table, but some people listening in might say, we don't need them anyway. We got this under control. Talk to any district that's had a Title IX audit from OCR and see what it cost them. Because in general, whatever we're spending has saved our schools money. They may not like what we told them, but it has saved them. So we think the value, the portfolio of services is valuable. We think the staff's valuable. We think the faculty, uh, we think that everybody else we involve is, is, in, is important. But just want you to know that there's a lot that goes into this. We had three of you specifically ask some very uh, pointed financial questions, and I, I appreciate you giving me this few minutes this morning. Anything else? Anything else? The others we can go a little faster. If that's the case, I, the next item of business is item 4.2, the additional calendar review. You were muted, by the way. There's no further questions. The next item of business is the additional calendar review. Thank you, and Mr. Billings, I, I was remiss because this was an 11th hour submission. Uh, we received a document this morning uh, expressing support for, for our work and your work. Uh, that is that last attachment of the 4.1 uh, from leadership of our legislature. Just wanted to reassure you uh, their support for your ongoing efforts. And I wanna make sure that's part of the record. Um, Calendar review, um, I, I just want to, to, to go, gl uh, go over, I've sent this to you, so everybody I know has had time to look at it. We won't spend a lot of time on it, but I um, want to just be sure that you have seen, uh, we have exhaustively tried to give you options on what we could do with championship play for winter sports. Now we have two, we have three sports and sport activities that are a real struggle right now. Um, so that everyone understands where we are, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Cope, if you don't mind, uh, give us a little capsule on where we are with potential swimming meets. Sure, thank you. Um, we have currently, we started swimming and then paused it the, the week of. Am I coming through? Okay. Currently, we, we, we started the, the, the first week of the season and then we paused it on that. Um, some of the difficulty we had our swim and event committee uh, get together, uh, finding the difficulty in pool access. Um, the colleges and universities currently are not letting third parties in um, with pool access. Um, and then with regard to a couple of uh, feedbacks uh, from that group, as well was the limited capacity and, and swimming, if you can't have spectators, how are you going to underwrite the costs for those regional uh, events? The, let's say the regional at UK, if it's $5,000 to host the, the regional meet there, 
and you can't have spectators because you need that capacity for the number of kids to be there, then how would they uh, fund that? Um, and then obviously looking, I know we're not talking specific about the swimming championships yet, but some form of potential reduction to the number of qualifiers we have. Uh, we currently bring 40 um, from each uh, um, event. Um, they also talked about, well, maybe spread the event out over some days so you didn't have that large group in. I don't think that would be favorable because then schools would have like three or four, five day long regional uh, meets. Um, and then looking at what some of the other states were doing that had fall swimming, um, they were going with time finals. In other words, there weren't prelims and finals. It was just come in, you swim, um, and we were done. So that's kind of where we are with swimming um, with regard to getting back in the pool or getting started. The feedback from them was to try to maybe push it back farther to where maybe they, that some of the, the universities and some of those other pools open. Um, and then we also even sought out a, a potential alternate site if the University of Kentucky is not available. Um, at Silver Lake in Northern Kentucky, they were open to hosting it, but obviously concerned with, you know, the guidance and limitations that would be held as well. We probably would still be looking at um, reduction in uh, the participants that are able to come. And again, I think all of this, we, we tried to explain to that group that anything that we do is going to be just for a one-year deal, uh, it's a COVID deal. And Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Barron. I know we've had issues with uh, wrestling facilities and, and wrestling uh, going on. If you want to kind of update uh, the board on uh, a little bit about where we are, because it all ties back to the calendar. Um, many of our issues, as you mentioned, Commissioner, are facility uh, led. Many people don't understand the, the size of, of a simple wrestling match. Uh, two schools wrestling um, you're, you're going to have uh, 14 bouts, and, you know, so you have 28 wrestlers plus coaching staff, trainers, scorekeepers, officials, and so forth. And with the limited attendance situations, many of the schools will not be able to uh, afford to pay for the officials. Um, and so many of the schools are now looking for tournaments to go to, feeling like, well, we could put an X amount of dollars into that tournament and at least get uh, an opportunity. Well, the tournaments are limited to the number of, of wrestlers and spectators and so forth. So um, it's a sport that um, of all sports, uh, wrestlers and coaches in the sport will tell you um, it's the most contact you're going to have. Um, you're going to spend six minutes rolling around a mat with another person face to face. So uh, there's, there's hesitancy uh, upon everyone in the wrestling community as to how we go forward with it. Really, that's that's the recap that I have. I will say one more thing, though, is most of the wrestling community is very um, excited about any opportunity that the board going forward can give them to be able to have. That. Thank you, Mike. And both of those are indicative of issues that are additional challenges with us starting in indoor sports. Uh, you know, the, the average listener is going to say, but what about football? What about soccer? There is, uh, from a health perspective, a tremendous concern about the difference uh, between indoor and outdoor activities and ventilation, et cetera. One of the things that we have looked at within our guidance documents, because we phase in uh, the, the number, number of teams that can be involved in both swimming and wrestling. We have had discussions, uh, albeit uh, pretty much cursory at this point, about whenever we start those, uh, some, I don't, I don't want to call it forgiveness, forgiveness but maybe, maybe uh, some variances in the indoor participation limit or indoor total limit, including participants. In other words, some states have had success. I know, I know Virginia, Virginia was the most recent one that was able to get the participants reclassified outside of the limit on attendance. It's, it's, it's not for, if I'm at a gym the size of Marshall County, County then I probably don't, don't have a problem even on the basketball, basketball side, side with including the participants in my percentage count. But, but unless, unless there's, there's a bigger gym than last time I was in Campbell High School, it's, it's a little, little bit different 
when, when you, you have to include, include those 50 or 60 that are involved with both teams, and immediately you're knocking off that number if you're complying with the order. So, so I think we've got a lot of inequity within our schools on some of these indoors. Wrestling is a challenge because I think we limited it during the first segment to five teams out of ballpark, it's five. Um, so that's instantly 70 participants because you've got to assume they're all going to have 14. Now you get into the larger programs that want to have exhibition matches because they want this kid who, just because he didn't qualify for a scoring match, to get a chance to wrestle. Well, those now get included, but so does their opponent. Now we also are trying to grow women's wrestling in our state or girls wrestling in our state. So maybe along with that regular tournament, they want to throw in a few exhibition matches for girls. Well, pretty soon, by the time you get referees and, and participants, you're full as far as your capacity goes. So that's something that is a real challenge. And that's why when we talk about starting, our focus today is on basketball, but we want to continue to review starting um, uh, on what, you know, what's going to come out, what's different, going to change with the guidance. I know that we talked this week to the folks at, at the university here uh, about, well, one of the universities here, uh, forgive me my alma mater, but uh, we did talk to UK today or this week, and I know that they are not looking at having their facility available to any outside group through the end of what would normally be the end of our regular season. So I think our people need to be prepared for some schedule adjustments on both uh, swimming and wrestling. Doesn't change, doesn't necessarily change the start. That's up to, that's really, they can work through. I would say regular season competition is even more of a struggle in those sports because the venues are so much smaller. We can go, uh, and I did not mention this under the comparison of states, but we have the advantage that in, in for our state events, we have some large high schools to choose from. We have a new high school with four to 5,000 seats in a gym that has opened their arms and said, please come have events here. Uh, we've, and they're not too far from here. We've got a number of bigger arenas, different than most states. We don't have a lot of our, we try not to have our big championships where we can. We want to have them at a, at a, premier college facility. You know, we, we want to give those kids that experience where we can. Now, in some cases, our tournament format doesn't allow that, but we sure try. And so, uh, you know, trying to do that, I think our folks are going to have regular season issues long before that. Um, I want to mention, as you look at the calendar options and as you have looked at them, we've talked about swimming, wrestling, and bowling. We are not uh, we're not sport. The sport activities, particularly the cheer and dance, we don't necessarily um, dictate when they compete or how many competitions they have. We just basically tell them what they're allowed to do. We have not set the dates for those events yet. We're going to need some more public health data. We know that it is not realistic. The original schedule that was talked about with, I believe, February regionals is probably not realistic with what we've got going on. But we are having a cheer championship and a dance championship this year, period. Uh, we don't know when. It may be April. It may be at some other point that we find a good spot in the calendar. What we do with basketball may open up other times. We don't know. But I don't want anybody out there thinking that there's been any talk about not having it. But we cannot discount the health concerns. And, and if, if they look, if participants look around, and I know I happen to be, <laughs> I don't know if, you, if they're real friends on Facebook or just people that know you, but I got several people that coach cheer that I'm, I'm, I'm tagged up with on, on Facebook and I love their enthusiasm, but they also know if they check around a lot of places, there's not a lot of in-person competitions going on right now. So we're, we're monitoring that and we're blessed to have several people, whether it's uh, Lucy, uh, who's been involved with cheer for years, Kim Parker Brown, who's been involved with cheer for years, uh, Jeff Saylor, who married into cheer, and therefore stays involved because of his spouse. We've got a lot of people with a lot of knowledge on cheer and dance, and we're going to do it, but we're going to do it right. So I don't want anybody thinking that we've got, you know, a, a plan to, to divest ourselves of cheer. Lastly, with calendar options, I've given you some examples of what basketball would look like with various start dates. We have had a number of suggestions, but a lot of it for, from our standpoint is driven by the, the start of it is, is driven by your all's input from schools. And I can answer questions about that. The end of it has to be in conjunction with our host partner. And we do have a long-term contract with the, the Lexington Center and Rep Arena to hold, our, to hold our championship. So 
We really have to look at when they are available. I have shared with you on the agenda uh, a schedule of what we have now from some original drafts, got a lot of questions, combine the two documents to where it's probably a little bit easier to see. But I wanna make sure you understand right now, if we have an event scheduled at Rep Arena that as of December the 10th, our capacity uh, in the building is 15%, 1-5%. And that includes participants and includes a pretty good allowance for the people working in the building. And that's if we only use the lower arena. So for comparison's sake, that is our attendance restriction if we are having girls basketball as we had it previously configured. If we are having boys basketball where we use the upper sides, which allow us more social distancing opportunities uh, by using the renovated seats, we take that capacity to around 2,500, but we also incur the expense of additional cleanup of the upstairs which would have to be done more frequently under the state resumption documents that have been approved uh, for election center. So just understand that. If we are not remedied from capacity restrictions in any way, we also would not have the double letter seats available, which are what you all sit in and the club sits in, we would have to find an alternate location because in order to get proper spacing of media teams, benches and everything else, we got to spread people out and use that space. There is alternates available for that area uh, based on some new renovated area. We know that as of December 10th, we are restricted on concessions with any event, but we do feel like that's going to be relieved with the restaurant order. We just don't know to what effect. Now talk about schedules. Um, as I have shared uh, in this document, and I'm not going to read every line because I think you're very familiar with it. Rupp Arena has some hard conflicts where they are not available. March 23rd through 28th, there's, although the, the, the arena might have some availability, there is some concern and problems because in Lexington, there is scheduled a, a show called Comic-Con. And I understand several of our friends at Public Health are really good friends with that program, but I can tell you they're restricted too. But they, while they don't use the arena, they'll be using the new convention center, they will utilize a great deal of the housing in downtown. So that's something to remember uh, as you discuss. We also need to remember that whatever we do that includes April 2nd is Good Friday, April 4th is Easter, and April 2nd through 5th are the NCAA postseason finals. And that's, uh, that's in that document as well. April 21st through 23rd, if we were to use any of the dates in that window, we are probably looking at additional hotel rooms uh, cost because that's also when Keeneland is meeting. And the Keeneland meet traditionally leads to an increase in prices for housing. And then we know that May 1st is Derby Day. Uh, we know that April 9th through 11th at this point is a hard conflict at this point with a, uh, a monster truck show. And why that becomes such a big conflict for us is there's nothing in there related to basketball. It's all brought in all the dirt that's needed to, to run that show then they've got to have time afterwards to get all that back out. So that is a full three day conflict. We also know right now that there is a currently scheduled the 27th and 28th of May or March, which is our two days, two of the days, the last two days of the window you selected in November. That is not available to use Rep Arena because of an event called Winter Jam. Now, Winter Jam is part of an event that has a series of places they go. So one, one show can't just say, we won't want you this day, we need you to move to this day, because it might domino other sites. But as of right now, they are using the 27th and 28th. So even if we were to stay with, our current, with the schedule you adopted uh, in uh, the last meeting in, in November, we know that our last tournament has to end and we have to be moved out on Friday. There is no Saturday, Sunday option. So we know that's out there. Um, and then we know that April 21st through 24th, we do not have an opportunity to utilize the Hyatt Regency because they are hosting a large conference in conjunction with the Land Rover three-day event. And the Land Rover three-day event, the former Rolex three-day event, uses a vast majority of the housing in Lexington. And that event is at this point a definite go. 
the last conflict we have that is a hard conflict that I don't think some of our coaches who started emailing you knew about, <laughs> and they, they copied us. April 12th through April 19th is a confirmed hard conflict as of this morning. Uh, that is Disney on ice, which requires complete conversion of the arena from a basketball floor. They take up the floor, they bring in all the all the contraptions that then fill up with water and make it ice. All of this is listed on the first part of that. That's why these these notes are important. I don't today we're not going to set the state tournament format. Uh, I can tell you right now it doesn't look like it's going to be conceivable to be our standard format for two weeks unless we move it to later in the spring. We do have an option at the end of April, the 1st of May, within the arena, there's nothing booked. We could do our traditional format, but I know that comes with other problems. So uh, we just have to accept the fact that our tournament is only gonna get a partial COVID shot because it got a big shot last year, but this year it's only getting a partial shot. We will be able to play. We just, it just might look different. So, with all of those date options in mind, uh, the calendar review can be considered done. I did provide for the board. This came off of KDE's website, and I know uh, the staff there has done yeoman's work keeping that information up to date, but I also know spring break options are changing all around the state just about every day. But as of right now, we have a schedule. When you look at it, you can see uh, the number of districts we have that are using the last week of March is 30 public school districts, 126 are using the first week of April and six are using the second week of April. So we have to decide, and it is an option to have events, including districts, regions and state opposite or during spring break. That's just not been done much before but you need to know that. And we do not have a good registry of non-public school spring breaks, but they generally marry up in the area uh, where they're located because the whole community is on break at the same time. That concludes that report, unless there's questions. That pretty much takes us all the way to uh, the four point. Correct. So we're, we're down to, we're, we're all the way. We're all the way down to item 5.0, the decision points, and we've got a couple of board members that need to be getting out of here in the next half hour, 45 minutes. I think it's yes. important that we need to go ahead and discuss those. Uh, there are three, one, item 5.1, to consider the adjusted calendar for state tournament dates. You have those three dates in front of you that we know that the arena is available. I think it's imperative that we set a date today. Uh, I just don't see how we can continue to progress and ask the staff to progress if we don't get a date set. Now that's Daryl Billings' opinion, but uh, what's the pleasure of the group at this point in time? Daryl, may I say uh, as something? Uh, you know, at this time, before we get into this, I, I really think it's important for our commissioner that's been doing this for a long, long time uh, and been working with these people day in, day out, these last, all through this COVID. I think it's important for, for to hear from him. I think we need to hear what his recommendation would be, to be quite honest with you. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about potentially losing staff. There's only one thing we can control, and we can at least control pieces of it that give us the best opportunity to 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 survive and and i think we need to hear what what, what uh, mr tackett has to say today mark I, his I think, recommendation is there the recommended motion is there is what his recommended motion is in the is in is in the well, I, i'd still like to hear from him. well on the state tournament I, i'm not going to I, i'm not going to beat around the bush we need to have it as late as we possibly can for the best opportunity for success given the facts we know now and that's why the recommendation is that we hold it later in the spring. We hold it that last part of April, at, including a, a fraction of that f first day or two of that first week in May to finish up. Now, that is the opportunity for us to have the best opportunity for success based on what we know now. Now, we can all sit here and speculate what ifs and what somebody's told us they're going to do and what somebody says is going to happen. We don't know right now. But today's facts that uh, that is our best opportunity for success 
for our championships that provide so much of the funding we detailed earlier. Is there any discussion regarding that? I know there is. Uh, yeah, well, I, I've already talked <laughs> quite a bit, but I'll I'll chime in. Uh, I totally understand our, or feel like I do our, our financial situation strain, and understand the the best opportunity uh, because there is hope that possibly the later you push it, you you, you could increase that attendance. Um, I just think in doing so, we run a lot of risk and. Uh, I just feel like I've got I got to continue to fight for uh, our spring sports that, that, that they don't get pushed back any farther. Um, and and uh, once again, I, I know I'm not sure where people stand. I haven't talked to a whole lot of people, but uh, I understand that. But I, I just feel the, the that, that second option, that, which is the end of March, first of April. Uh, that that's what I would. Uh, I like that. It's not ideal, but this is a pandemic. It's not. I don't, I would, you know, I know we need some some revenue, but uh, it's just my two cents. I would like to make a comment, if possible. This is Alvin. Anyone else? Yes, Alvin. As far as the spring sports go, I do think it's important to point out that even if option three were to be approved, spring sports would still begin with their spring break as or the spring break is the first uh, opportunity to have competition. Is that correct, Commissioner? Yes, sir. That first of the three published breaks. And they would get a full season, if not an extended season. Correct. Mr. Garrison. I would like to make a comment. Yeah. Mr. Garrison. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, for me, I, I'm really, I, I, I'm with the commissioner on the importance of having it as late as possible, but I'm also thinking, and again, this may not be popular, but for me, I think in, in, in uh, polling some of our superintendents up in Northern Kentucky, we, are, we think we need to uh, push back the start a week or two, meaning uh, we can have practice next week, but I'm talking about game play. Right now, we don't even know what school is going to look like next week. I mean, not next week. We're not we're not sure what school is going to look like on January 4th. And once again, uh, if we vote with a plan that starts the first week, there's a possibility we could be starting sports again without school even being in session. So for me, uh, I think with uh, everything we've heard from the scientists, uh, to, uh, you know, we've had survey data from coaches, spring sport coaches, as well as winter sport coaches. Uh, I think anything other than maybe postponing a week or two puts superintendents in a tough position uh, after break, because I think once again, we're gonna be in a situation where we're making a decision where school may not be, or might be in session, but we don't know the parameters of that. But yet we're starting game play. And again, I'll go back to, I think it sends the wrong message to our kids that we are going to have, you know, whether we're not in school, but we're going to have games. And it just uh, makes sports a priority over school. So that's just my opinion. Again, I'm not advocating to, to uh, against the spring sports in any way. I think there's a potential for us to have a win-win all the way around. Spring sports gets a full season. Basketball gets a full season. We have a, a state tournament with the potential of having a large crowd. So I, and, and like I said, the scientific data says we need to wait after a holiday a couple of weeks. I just, for me, I just not quite sure the debate, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Garrison. And, and again, uh, that that is still yet to be determined as far as the starting date. Mm -hmm. uh, we're strictly talking about a state tournament date at this point in time and kind of trying to move backward. Uh, and I do appreciate the concern and appreciate what you're saying, but I just had a, a board member sitting next to me said, you know, we're doing that now. We're playing football now, not in school. So, so I mean, I, I, you know, we've got to make a decision and put a flag in the ground and say, guys, we got to attempt to move forward. 
Now, how good it's going to look, I don't know. That's just my opinion, uh, and I really wish we would. Is there anyone else has any concerns regarding the state tournament dates? Greg? Uh, I agree, uh, and I respect everybody's decision. Obviously, the commissioner has a vast amount of uh, information over the years. I would agree, agree with uh, Kirby that, you know, that second option, and I know it's somewhat uncharted territory or with Easter weekend and the commissioner said we can find ways to work around that and spring break. You're talking about a limited number of teams. And I think uh, I'm hopeful and I know it's ifs and what's I'm hopeful that, you know, we're going to see that 15 percent lifted by then. And I think we can have a good crowd. And that's just my opinion and my input. I just said a quick question. Um, in my area, the the spring sports people that I've talked to, um, many of them are, are very okay with going into the, the, the latter weeks of June and starting later, uh, just because of the weather and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I didn't really get as much opportunity. I mean, the, the read on the survey that, that, because it came this morning for me, but the read on the survey from the uh, from from the, some of the spring sports, what was what was the look on that, Julian? If you can help us. Well, both we when talking to the baseball coaches association, and, and it's uh, of course on the on the uh, meeting page. If anybody wants to see it, but the baseball coach association reached out and asked uh, Mr. Cope, and I was involved in the early discussions uh, for what questions they should ask their members. That survey is provided. They. Uh, at the same time, we, we asked them to prioritize, realizing everybody's not going to get everything they want. So first of all, is this a concern to you and how priority a concern it was? Their number one priority was having a full season, period. Their, their lowest priority was overlap. And I will say there's been some feedback since then that, well, it depends on how much overlap, but that's not how they responded on the survey. So I, I, it's, that's just the way people are when you ask questions and then they find out maybe they'd like to have answered it differently. It was not as high a priority. I, the thing we've kept stressing is it's one year. It's one year. And it's certainly better than what happened to those last spring. We know it's also, it does have, honestly, the other feedback mark is it has a disparate impact on smaller schools. Without, they have more over, they're more likely to have an overlap, the two or three stud athletes that play for both uh, softball and girls basketball or baseball and, and boys baseball. The, uh, and basketball. The, the girls coach association, the softball coach association, excuse me, their survey results were pretty close, same way. Um, don't know who did, didn't respond. Kind of glad we don't have individual names because it, it is a pretty good uh, sampling. We had better, more than half uh, it's probably three quarters of the baseball schools respond. Uh, Mr. Cope, I don't know if there was any other commentary that uh, Sherm has given you. I, I pretty much is here, here it is. Here's that lake. Commissioner, was was were those responses <laughs> from members of the association or, or were they from every school? Because not every school of our 270 member schools are members of the Baseball Coaches Association or the Basketball Coaches Association or the Softball Association. So in, in, in full disclosure, if that was from every one of our member schools, there's a little difference in that survey. Uh, I have spoke to three or four schools east of Lexington that have eight softball players that play on the basketball team. Spoke to a coach this morning on my way in that three of his starting five basketball players are also potential Division One AA or Division One softball players. So I, I, my, my question would be, are, are those responses from every baseball school, every softball school, or just the coaches association and those members that are members of that association? Well, I'll answer, I'll answer in two ways. Because they didn't take initiative to join the coaches association, we shouldn't penalize the vast majority that did respond. We had 188 or 187 responses, of which Sherm said maybe four were duplicates, multiple people in the same school. That's 183 out of 240 playing baseball. Because the others didn't take initiative, I don't think you penalize those that responded. But their surveys, it's very similar demographics. The softball association is a little smaller. They probably have 15, 10, 10 or 15 less schools. The basketball coach association has almost everybody. And again, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wise for us to somehow discredit the results 
because of, of a, of a non-joiner's opinion. No, I didn't mean to no, do I know that. You're not. That's no, I, that's not my intent. But Correct. I mean, my intent is if we, we represent 270 member schools, Correct. then did we hear from 270 member schools? Or did we just hear from 35? No, I, we heard from 180, 178. That was the purpose on the of the question. Side and 170 on the softball side. That was the purpose and of the question. That's what I want to be sure. I didn't want anybody out there construing that, that somehow this is different. If we play basketball up to week 43, then the overlap would be six weeks with spring sports, correct? Potentially, yes. In, in a nine-week season. And that's if, I, I think the concern with the amount of overlap, I think, would be yeah. uh, considering they didn't have spring sports last year. Now, that's what I've heard. Agreed. And I've also heard uh, the other side of that, just so you know, we've been told that, that they are used to you losing a week or two because of weather. So it's if we could, if the if the overlap could be minimized, it probably can't be eliminated. But could it be minimized? Could it be two to three weeks? And I, don't, I, don't, I, I agree. I think that they don't mind overlap if it's minimal. Right. Uh, and I agree with the, the first two weeks are miserable during baseball softball season typically. So. Well, the wisest thing long term is probably to look at starting spring break because frankly that's their. That's been the kind of kickoff for the season anyway, and it's clear of all the basketball, but that's long term. We can still, they can still have a full season and start spring break. And we just got, you all then have to decide the overlap. Okay. I think, you know, I, think go ahead. I, I agree. I think the overlap is, you know, the couple of weeks is fine. I think they're used to doing the overlap, but if we're, we're talking a six week possible, six week overlap is a nine month or a nine week season. I just think that's too much to ask. For the spring sports again, we, we go back to saying that sports are the ones that got you know the shaft last year, and then we're going to try to protect them as much as we can. I just think that's asking a lot. That's just that's just my personal opinion. If there's a way we can reach some kind of middle ground with that, have minimal overlap, I'd be all for that. But asking six out of nine, I think that could potentially be too much. So just just my thought. I just think we're we're in a, we're in a bind. We'd love to do that, but I think we're in a bind when it comes to facilities. You know, if we have a long time, long term contract with Rep Arena, we really have no facility opportunities other than the open weeks they give us. You know, I think something else too is these overlaps, you know, after the first districts are over with, the re yeah, roughly half of the teams are gone already. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, in the perfect world, I mean, I was a softball coach before I was a basketball coach. And um, and in the perfect world, you don't want any overlap in, in and I understand what everybody's saying, I, and I don't disagree with anybody, but it still goes back to the opportunity to what might be best for the association to be able to carry on. It makes it tough. It's just not a good, just not a good deal. So no right answer, I don't think. I think option two does address that, though, Mark. If you look at option two. Here, here, uh, uh, I was just going to say two things. things. Number, Number one, one, kids, kids are going to play with or without, without us. us. And, and I, I've, I've said, said this before. before. I trust our coaches taking care of that better than I do at the church gym or the YMCA or whatever. I think they're going to be safer with us because I think our coaches are going to do a great job of taking care of them. I also know that if we move the state basketball tournament back to the end of April and the first part of May, you're going to devastate some spring sports whatever sport that might be. And, and I, I love spring sports. I'm a spring sport guy. But we're we're going to devastate. Kids, kids are going to have to make choices between do I finish, finish out the basketball season or do I start softball, baseball, track, track or tennis? tennis. And, and, and I don't think that's a fair. I, I agree there should could be some overlap, but I, I, I mean, I agree with option two myself. The one thing I think we've got to be aware of is we don't know. We may push this thing to May the 15th and still be at 15%. We may go to 35% March 1. Uh, I think, again, this is just a shot in the dark. We, we're, we really don't know. But I think it's imperative that we decide today as a group where we're going to put our flag in the ground at. Uh, and, and I can respect everybody's opinion. Uh, I, I, I mean, no disrespect to our basketball coaches, to our baseball coaches, to our softball coaches. I mean, no disrespect to, the, to my fellow board members. But we have got to decide something to say, this is where we're going to go. Let's move forward. Let's go to work and find a way to let this experienced staff make it a pleasurable and enjoyable experience for, for high school basketball in Kentucky for 2021. 
we saw what happened in 2020 and we're still paying the dip we're still paying the, the losses of it you know, let's at least move, try to move forward well, mr Billings, with that in mind unless you have other comments I'll, the recommended motion is option three and i'm I, we've given you all the data we can give you i think you're, you're able to move do i have a motion to accept any of the options well, the, the, that are on the table. The recommended motion is option three, and that's do your I, pro. Do I, have a, do, I have a, do I have a motion to accept recommended option three? I, I have a motion from Mark. Do I have a second? Lucy raised her hand. I second that motion. I have a motion from Mark and a second from, from Mr. Garrison. Is there any more discussion to accept the recommended motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the recommended motion, which would be play starting, uh, state tournament play April 24th to May 9th, signify by raising your right hand. I am gonna need some assistance with this, sir. Okay. In the building, we have one, two affirmatives. Yeah. Mr. Collins is trying to tell we have to do a roll call. That's remarkable. And and with the Zoom with the Zoom meeting, we've been advised by legal counsel we need to do a roll call vote. So at this point in time, Miss Mitchell will do a roll call vote for those that are with us on Zoom and those that are in the in the in the building. Miss Bigwood? No. Billings? No. Yes. Ms. Galloway. Yeah, Mr. Garrison, can you signal your vote, please? Yes. 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 I'm a yes. Mr. Hawkins? Yes. Oh. He voted. Good thing I was not muted. Mr. Howard? No. Mr. Lovett? No. no. I apologize. I'm still muted. That's why I opened. Mr. 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 Mark. Mr. Miller. Yes. Ms. Moore. Yes. Ms. Ms. Parker Brown. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Slosher. No. Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Thompson? No. Mr. Wilfoy? No. Mr. Wyman? Yes. We don't have a representative from the private schools in Northampton. It was 9 8. It was 9 8. Fails. Fails. The vote fails. is 9 to 8. That motion fails. Do I have another motion? Okay. Mr. I would like to make a motion that we consider option two. I have a motion. I have a second from Trent. Is there any discussion on option two? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting option two, uh, we will be conducting a roll call vote. Ms. Mitchell will do, will do that vote. It will be a yes in favor of option two or a no against option two. Just one second. 
sir. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Ms. Baker? Ms. Baker? Baker? Yes. Yes. Mr. Billings? Yes. Mr. Coldire? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Mr. Galloway? Yes. Mr. Garrison? No. Mr. Hawkins? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Levitt? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Miller? No. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Parker Brown? Yes. Ms. Slosher? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mr. Wilhoyt? Yes. Mr. Wyman? No. Passes 14 to 3, sir. That motion passes 14 to 3. And, and with, for, for with clarity, with one abstention being the district that Mr. Klein's represent that does not have a representative at this point in time until January. Right. And for the people who have not explored all the options, those dates that you've asked us to try to find a state tournament window on right now would be March 29th through April 8th. And then if that event cancels on the 27th and 28th, it's already scheduled. We have a little bit more options. Okay. So we, we sure could possibly happening. bring that that other weekend into play, Correct. if if not. But uh, those are the those are the dates that we're asking the staff and the commissioner to to, to form a state tournament uh, and start their go ahead and commit to uh, the Lexington Center and the Rupp Arena for housing and everything associated with it. The next item of business is item 5.2. Postseason event potential schedule adjustments for basketball start of season. You see the rationale. You see everything there. Uh, you see the recommended motion. Do I have a motion to accept that start, which is the 13th of the practice starting the 14th day of December and play starting January 4th, 2021? Do we have a motion? I have a motion by Kirby, a second by Greg. Is there any discussion? These are the dates that you set last meeting and in keeping with what you did in July, you're that made Rob. Okay. Okay. Um, now with what you did in July and then we confirmed in August, same thing we're doing now. What you did in November, we're all, you start with this as option one and then you all decide. So basically we have, at this point in time, we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Mr. Jerry? Yes. I, I just, um, I think I could, I could live with being in segment three for the remainder of 2020 with practice starting the 1st of January. I just don't want us to jump the gun and do something that I think is irresponsible and push games back into late January. I know that's one of the options. I know that's not the motion that we're on here, uh, but I can't support the motion that we start practice uh, official practice on the 14th with the uh, with the status of what the state is in right now. I, I, all due respect to legislative leadership, I think it's a bad decision. Thank you, Mr. Wyman. Is there any more discussion? Mark? I agree with Jerry. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we talked on and on and on about some of these surges after holidays, and I think it's irresponsible for us to uh, to, to, to try to start January 1 and start practices right away. Uh, I just don't think that's a good move. I, I think that uh, kids need to be with their coaches and um, some type of a segmented situation where the kids are kept, kept somewhat safe. I think that's the best route to go 
um, and then do what we had talked about yesterday and starting with that third week or something. I forgot what the week was off the top of my head, but just just my opinion. I just, uh, I'll, of course, I'll support whatever, but just my opinion. Is there any further discussion? Anyone from our Zoom? Could I say Trent? If, if we do start playing games January 4th, could we even limit the crowd even less? I mean, if that's an option, if we're trying to get kids to play, we're not worried about the crowd. I mean, is that something we could look at maybe even if we're, if we're, if our goal is to get kids to play and, and stop the spread of this virus, don't have crowds or have very, very limited crowds, even more so than the 15% or whatever. Um, I just think that's something we need to consider. You know, back before when we were talking about starting sports, everybody said, we'll do whatever, just let them play. You know, I got 250 emails, let them play. We asked them to do two things, and that was to wear a mask and socially distance, and it's been a fight the whole football season. It's, it's been, been a fight, fight during the whole fall sports season. So if you really want them to play, are you willing to sit at home and let your kids go play? I mean, I think that's something we have to consider if we're, if we're going to start. I think in all candor, we, we are in just about daily communication. Uh, I want to publicly thank Dr. Connie White for helping us. I know last Saturday we had a pretty touchy issue around our football playoffs. On, uh, when she was traveling somewhere, we, she was helping. And she's been the liaison with a lot of superintendents over this whole deal with her and Dr. Stack. I think we can consult with them. Remember, one of the advantages we have is we divided each of these seasons into segments. We could easily say that that first segment has a much more restricted attendance policy. And we can consult with them immediately on you all uh, deciding that they can start. And that, that represents the trade-off as you're talking with them. We know you'd rather us not practice, play, but if we're going to play, we're, going, we're willing to restrict ourselves. And I think that would be a, a tremendous a foresight from this body trying to tell them that, look, I think it's a pretty good compromise. But we will work with them and let you, we can easily let you know and let the schools know pretty quickly during this practice segment if you open it up for practice. And I think we're going to see more of that in the coming days as the restaurant deal opens back up. We're going to see a little bit more of that. If you all watched the governor yesterday, from my watching of it, he almost insinuated we're going to try to be back in school in January. So, so I, that but that was my take on it. He didn't say that, but that was my take on it. So who knows? I mean, but yeah, I think that's a great idea, Trent. I think it's awesome. I think the other thing it, it really points out to us, and I apologize, Mr. Howard, but the other thing it really points out to us, the, the concerns about students being with students supervised in a building can extend to after the game, even if you're playing sports. It's when the community gets involved that we've got to restrict. And there, the, we, 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 you're kind of showing that you're hearing what they're saying. And it's really about the community event. I have watched every week of our football playoffs, our teams have to tell us what their stadium capacities are. And we only have a couple that are allowing very many people other than two to four parents. So it, they are, they're responding, and I think they will respond. Julie, I got a, I, and we've done this before. We've, we've had, had volleyball inside, inside the gym. gym. You know, and you know, I don't want to, you know, say that it's exactly the same, but we have experience. The schools do have experience of limiting crowds. Um, you know, at least from, from my point of view, our schools have been doing a good job, I think, limiting crowds. But if you tell us there is no crowds or we need to go that route, I think we can do it also. But we do have experience of limiting crowds in the gyms, and we, we have some kind of guidance that uh, we have been meeting. So. I think whatever this board comes up with, I think we're going to abide by it as long as kids are with the coaches and, and get a lot of play. Well, and I will say this personally, it would I would find it hard, and I have made this statement to the people of public health, to, to try to implement any directive that restricts a parent from seeing their kid. But it's the general community that you can restrict. And I've seen that very creatively done by our schools with – Two per parent, contact the AD if you got a special situation because we don't all have nuclear families. I, I don't think we'd ever want to really push a parent not to see their kid, but the other community may just have to wait. So basically that, that the two week period after our holiday season, uh, that could be the time that we say, you know, if we're going to start playing January 4th, you know, we're going to give it maybe to the 18th uh, and the only one in, in the gym would be uh, the parents. Uh, and, and then relax after that and maybe go to 10% and gradually get to that. 
uh, but but not one of those deals where maybe it doesn't have to happen all season. But we know we're going to see what happens after you know our Thanksgiving holiday season, then, then Christmas and New Year's, and take precaution. We say you know come January fourth, it's going to be slim pickings on who's in. Just parents. I would and then, have, and I then would. increase it after that if we can. And you know what? Maybe we can't. But if we're here to do the right thing and let the kids play, then watch at home and let the parents see. Because if not, because you know I know basketball is a uh, it is a huge spectator sport in this state, but it's about the kids right now, and we got to make sure they get a chance to play. I saw one kid said last night on Twitter, "I'll play in an empty gym with a mask on. Just let me play." And that right there, if we have to give those kids that opportunity, then that's what we have to do. I agree with that 100 percent. Now, I would say this. I think it is important that we allow the, 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 the Department of Health to, to, do, oh, yeah. to be the guidance on that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's something this board needs to take on guidance personally. But if the Department of Health says 15 percent, then 15 percent it is. If they we'll say 5 percent, then it's 5 percent. Yeah. We'll work with them. That would definitely be a staff working with, the board, with their, their department item. There are, I think, of cases that say we'll give a couple of options, either a small percentage, which is dictated by our health department or whatever, or a certain number per child that's participating uh, and let the district or school decide from there. I just want to go back and just add into what you guys are saying. You know, fall sports was a true testament of what we do in our state. I think with the help through the KHSA and all the staff, athletic directors and superintendents and principals, I'm telling you what, I take my hat off. There may have been some isolated cases of where we had trouble with masks or social distancing, but uh, I agree with the commissioner. There were there were a, a myriad of creative ways to make sure attendance. And I learned a lot as an athletic director and I had to make, had to, had to back up. Uh, but we, as a whole, as a state did a tremendous job proven that kids are safer on our campuses than they are anywhere else. I mean, it speaks volumes that we're here getting ready to move on with winter sports, the success that we had and with the KHSA staff and all the data and all the information and leadership of our schools is one heck of a job by fall sports schools. One heck of a job. I like to see, we talk about the segments, the segment back to the basketball and you know, the help them health people were involved in that but i would still like to see the association come out and say for segment one or however long first few weeks whatever two tickets per kid parents you know there are situations obviously there but to just go extra pro step and limiting those numbers in those games because when we say 15 percent or whatever percent you know there's going to be people out there that's going to push that envelope but i think if we're going to do this and go down this road i think stepping out and say hey Two tickets for segment one for the last two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is, that's what it's going to be or what we're asking for. And then we roll with that and hopefully be able to stretch it out more as the season goes on. But putting, you know, putting your foot down, I think it's, it's really important to send out a message across the state. If we're going to start and on the fourth and play, you might as well be out in front of it. There's one more thing I want to add that people keep commenting about, and that's revenue. I think we've seen more and more schools throughout the state, more one of them. That we, we've put the video camera in the gym and we're, we're, we're going through the subscription process. You know, we're going to find a way for people to still generate money for the programs and we're going to find a way for our community to still see ball games. I think that's just the wave of the future and I think that's a, something we all need to look at. And I know a lot of schools are really looking into it. the NFHS network and uh, the Pixelot program and uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities out there for us to still generate money and still uh, have fans view our product. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Yeah, I, I, um, in all respects to, to, to Larry, we went through a volleyball season and, and uh, at the 15% and uh, we had no student body that was part of it. The only kids that ever stayed. Matter of fact, at the very beginning of the year, our freshmen would play the match and they would have to go home with their parents. And then we had our JV because of crossover and our varsity would stay. But you know, we at a later day we started adding those kids in, and we were we were we were spaced really well. Uh, our opponents followed the rules really well. But to say only two per kid 
and all of us have different situations, different size gyms. I think it ought to be up to the school, to be quite honest with you. I don't think we ought to be dictating that. I think it ought to come. They know 15 percent, and they need to follow the rules that we put out there and do the numbers and find out how many they can go. But to just say two, I, I just I don't think that should be something that we get into. Well, I know when for football, when we were doing something like that, we started thinking about the number of families that have like two parent families. And so I think football, we said four, because at least that took care of if you had, you know, like a mom and dad that were divorced and then married, remarried, um, we sort of <laughs> looked at it like that because we hated for a kid to have to decide which parent was going to get it come. So. I, I, feel like, I feel like I need to tell you, though, that <laughs> most states are a whole lot more restrictive than just throwing open a percentage because they're concerned. And I, my, my worry is if we're going to say we're going to go that first day and it appears as though your discussion is about that, at least the first two weeks needs to be pretty restrictive simply because that's that period coming off New Year. We've got to recognize that. And if we can't live without attendance, then don't play the first two weeks. Push everything back to the third week. But I think we're going to probably need to restrict that first part, and, and then we can accelerate. And that, and that's just sending that message. If you're going right. to go out on the fourth, whether it's two or four, I just threw two out there, you know. But sending the message that hey, we understand the problems, but we want to allow parents. There are certain situations that you've got that you got to look at, but going above what the health might people might recommend to saying, hey, we want to be ahead of this and, and limit that number, uh, you know, because I'm 15 percent, let's roll, but, you know, because it's a money thing, too, at the school level. I mean, I, I, like most superintendents, I got a bill from our football team. We've never been, you know, in the hole with the football program. We are this year. And now we're going to have to come up with that extra money to, in, in basketball. You know, all sports are going to be the same way. So we'd love to have, you know, if we can, as many people as we can, but I think sitting that and saying, hey, we're going to limit the number of people the first few weeks, get through the two weeks after the uh, holidays and see how it rolls. I, I think it sends a strong message from the association to, to, you know, we're trying to work both sides here. And we're prioritizing the fact they get to play. And we're prioritizing we get to play. But yet we still recognize that we're looking at that two week uh, or whatever week period for that quarantine after a, a thing we're going along with us. I think that's I agree. Is there any further discussion, discussion to? <laughs> yeah. I Cam, Miss yeah, Brown. I, I think we need to err on the side of caution um, because, again, there's so many moving parts to COVID. So I think it's important that we say, okay, we're going to limit. And then we can loosen up as we go. And I think it's our best, our best course of action. Well, I want to, I want to be sure it's clear. We're not the board doesn't need to be trying to set a limit. We really need to have that consultation with public health. And we need to follow. But up we've got, we've heard your feedback, and we'll take that further, for sure. Thank you. The motion on the floor is that we start practice December fourteenth. You have to. With gameplay starting January the 4th. There has been a motion, a second, been several discussions. We will have to do a roll call vote. I'll ask Ms. Mitchell at this point in time. All those in favor, signify. If you are in favor of, of that, say yes. If you're opposed, no. Ms. Dickler? Yes. Mr. Billings? Yes. Mr. Coldire? Yes. Mr. Evans? No. Mr. Galloway. Yes. Mr. Garrison. No. Mr. Mr. Hawkins. No. Mr. Howard. Yes. Mr. Lovett. Yes. Mr. Mr. Miller. No. Mrs. Moore. Yes. Mrs. Yeah. Parker Brown? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Washer? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. 
Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mr. Wilhoy? Yes. Mr. Wyman? No. Five no's. Twelve yes. Five no's. Twelve yeas. Twelve yeas. Five no. Uh, the motion carries. Mr. Billings, I, I believe based on our earlier uh, commentary, you can defer items five three and five four to the staff. We will need to look at those facility issues now that you've said they start and uh, deal more firmly with the uh, with swimming, wrestling, and bowling starts based on those facility issues. If no one, if no one on the board has a problem with that, we will defer that to the to the staff to do that. Item six, additional action items. 6.1, additional additional special meeting or defer other winter championships to January review. I don't think we need to do that. Yes, We've made that sense. decision today. Item 6.2, consideration of district alignments. The requests in District 29, North Oldham, Oldham, South Oldham, and Trammell County, and 31, Carroll County, Eminence, Gallatin County, Henry County, and Owen County. That is the... Uh, that is the consideration. Commissioner, would you like to expand? Real quick summary. Um, Trimble County has requested on numerous occasions to be uh, moved back into their, their former district where Carroll County and a bunch of their uh, neighbors are located. Uh, they, as part of the 2006 realignment project, were moved in with the three old county schools. Um, we have consulted, I think some of you have talked to uh, those schools. Everyone involved appears to be favorable if we consider these items together. And that is, uh, when, in 2006, when the basketball alignment was revised, one of the major issues dealt around three team districts. And while fans over 50 keep wanting to say eliminate all of them, what we can't help is all the consolidations that have gone on. So the board made a plan where if you're in a three team district, you have to play each other. It became a seated district by rule. So no one could walk into a three-team tournament district meeting and draw into the regional tournament. You had to, you had to win something. Well, when we set that up, and that has quieted most of the concerns about it, but when we set that up, uh, there, were, there was an automatic tiebreaker to a blind draw for teams that play once. So that's why 6.3 goes into that. I, I, you probably want to consider them together. I, I would say if you want to get a motion, it's 6.2 and 6.3 go together. A 6-3 would give the district involved in Oldham County and any other three-team district we have would still keep the provision where the district decides if they play once or twice, still has the head-to-head -head tiebreaker, but if they're tied and there's really mathematically only one unbreakable tie you can have with a one with playing one game or two games, and that's everybody be one and one, three teams being one and one, they can develop their own tiebreaker. And, and they've, they've got, got apparently got one in mind. And, and that's, that's fine. And if that's not it, if they don't do that, then it defaults to the RPI. We've got a default, but there's no more, still no more chance for you to draw into a regional tournament and the revenue or play they involve. So it fixes both sides. Commissioner, when do we realign basketball? It is not scheduled because the board's policy says that until, unless there's a new school opened or closed, or you have a membership request that's approved by everyone in the area, you're not even gonna consider it. You just talk about it in January, see if there's any issues. There is no schedule realignment. Is there any gonna be issues with some of the Danville Christians, some of those folks coming online? Is there gonna be, is there gonna force any kind of realignment well, that pushes people into other districts? It's a good reminder at this point, no, because they went in with that existing district and we have met twice with the people in, in the 12th region to speak to Danville Christian. We've met twice with them. They have not yet come up with a desire to meet or an alternative plan, nor have they requested that a change be made in writing. And they, they can hand that. That's normally looked at the board in January. So if anybody out there wanted to request that be looked at, they need to have an answer. One of the problems in that district is they don't all play boys and girls. So it may be more of a problem on one gender. But that's, that's the way it has worked. And as we have these new schools, there's definitely issues coming along. Uh, as we've expanded. 
Kirby and I have worked extensively. I, I don't, I don't, the only, only thing I ever knew about Trimble County is that one time I was in the, uh, as in the eighth region for about five years coaching Oldham County. So I got to know all these little places and different schools, but uh, their AD reached out to me as a young AD some time ago, reached out to Kirby because Kirby represents them. Uh, we need to do this. This is the right thing to do. And, uh, and uh, when you have, uh, when you have, <clears throat> They're in the they're in the 29th and the 31st is is where they want to go back to, but when you have a when you have a consensus across the board that that's the best thing for them to have happen, the Odom's still that way. I, I think it's really really important. I mean, there's a lot of other circumstances we could talk about that, uh, but but it, it's the right thing to do and it's the right thing to do for them now. Um, we have that ability. Odd means is a tiebreak situation that I really don't agree with anyway. Um, I think we need to make this happen for these people. They, uh, they've done it the right way. They've been very patient. Uh, they were pushed in uh, because they happened to touch the northern side of the Odom counties when they added North Odom. Um, down the road as Odom is growing, it might be 10 years down the road, I don't know, but they very well could have another school anyway. Um, and all that was asked of us was the tie break. And, uh, and the other thing, to be quite honest, they don't want us to turn around in January and pick one of the other ones out and send you're going to go that way. Uh, so I am. And I'll, I'll just kind of piggyback on that being the region I represent. Uh, I did speak with Superintendent Will Coxon, and, and she's from Trimble County and very invested in that community. Uh, and so, uh, like you said, I think it's something we need to do. At the same time, when you represent a region that's affecting other teams, you want to make sure that, that how, how does all the kind of schools feel and then also how do the other just teams feel in that other district that, that Trimble will be coming into and i've had a chance to speak with all the Oldham county ad's and uh, as long as we make sure that, that they're not penalized for the three team district and, and the hearing commissioner say that, that they won't be then they're okay with that obviously they would rather have a 14 district but they understand the situation and they're okay with Trimble moving out However, uh, in the other district, and speaking with those ADs, and I, I've spoken with everyone except one, left a message. Uh, they're okay. Uh, their fear is that later on down the road that they're not moved in there. And, and uh, so I wouldn't want to do anything that would cause Oldham County to not be able to see the way they need to, uh, or that would force a Henry or Eminence or Gallatin into that. So if we can do that and assure that, then it, it's, it's definitely something to do. Being someone that coached in that region for 10 years, uh, they need to be in the other district. There's no doubt about it. That's where they belong. And uh, I, I hope you can support that. Uh, I know the three team is not ideal, but guys, this is a little different situation. And uh, this community and those kids need that opportunity. Being, being a Dowling Thomas, uh, how do we put make a 16 district and leave a three team district in the next community. No, I, and again, I don't know enough about the area to, to ask that. But and I would just, but I just, when you talk about a 16 district, then at that point in time, I know where I'm from right. in Eastern Kentucky. Then all of a sudden, now I'm going to have a school say, well, hey, you know, we just touch a bit, bit piece of Letcher County. Why should we be in the 54th? You know, so I, I don't know. I just, when we take 16 districts and make it, now we're going to make a 16, how much of a disservice are we doing? Because at some point in time, with schools coming on, uh, attendance, you know, school, new schools being built, uh, school attendance changing, uh, I, I just, I don't understand it, I guess. And I guess I'm just asking for some type of... I, I think you would have to understand the dynamics of both communities and their locations. And, and to know that the Oldham County Schools, uh, you know, you have Oldham and they split and had North, uh, excuse me, South and North. Uh, understand that area, drive through that area, and then drive up for a little bit more to, to the other communities and, and see the, the difference in the enrollment. Uh, and, and it's just tough for, for they go to the vocational school uh, with the other students. They don't inter mingle with the Oldham County kids. And it's just not, uh, it's never, uh, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but you know, I've talked with the, the folks at Trimble and Oldham. Uh, the, the games are pretty, uh, and Mark, you can attest to this, they're uh, pretty, Pretty lopsided. Yeah, the dynamics, I'm sure, uh, Oldham yeah. County are different. What, how does Oldham feel about it? Well, I, I talked to all the Oldham ADs last night. Once again, you talk to them, what they'll say is there's no way they're coming to the Oldham for the bus. Uh, not in any way, shape, or fashion. You know, they're the competitive. I don't know why you talk about that. You need to mark them. Mark them. 
my apologies. Uh, you know, uh, Darrell, Darrell's question was was uh, basically, what do the Oldham County Schools feel about this? They support it 100 percent. It's not even a, a question about it. Um, you know, one of the um, one of the tie breaks that they have is a uh, is a 20 point deficit cap. That's the first tie break of a three way tie break. Second one they have that gets them to maybe a two way. And then if they can't get to a two way, then they in the past they we they they had planned on going cantrails. So that's that's their tie break in their particular 29th where this Trimble County is. It, it, it really doesn't even factor in, and I hate to say it like this, but uh, I'll just be upfront. They're not a they're just not a challenge in any program right now to these Oldham County schools. They're too big, too strong, too powerful, too many kids, too too much, too much of everything. And uh, they were put in there because somebody built a new school. And uh, there were probably uh, other options that were at least comparable, but for whatever reason, it was them. And and they, they've been beaten down over all these years. And, um, and it's time for a change and we can make that change happen. As far as a six team district, it's no different than a five team district. You know, a five team district, you have your playing game in the brackets. 16 district, you have two playing games and you have a couple buys. So it's really no difference whatsoever. But uh, I mean, like I said, I know it's odd. I know it's a big request, but <clears throat> it's time. It's time for these people it's the right and, and everybody over in the other. And, and it may be the right thing. That's a, And one more question, again, being the devil's advocate, it is this the right time to do it but with with covid and schedules already out and are, are is the, are they a seated district are the old a seated district at this point they have already worked that out among the nine schools okay. how they would take that okay. and and to answer your your, your question Darryl, um the uh right now trimble county plays every single one of the 31st um the other five teams twice with the exception of henry they only play them once at this time so, so they would open their arms up and then the Odoms would be fine because seeing the Odoms, there's a very good chance they can come up with a lot of three-way ties because they're very competitive with each other. Some of them lately are up in the top of the state. And um, so, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's where they are. I mean, they've all made plans and hopeful and, and I, we really wanted to do it now. So probably COVID times is the best time in the world to do it because of what they're going through. I mean, I'm driving the back roads going out to their school because I was actually talking to Kyrie Elsley and got lost and uh, ran into a bus. And what that bus was doing was giving food to kids. And, uh, and you know, the two little kids ran out of this trailer to get to that. Now, a lot of that goes on at the other end of, the, of, the, of that district, if you know what I mean. So, so I think it's something that we need to do. And, and I'll piggyback on that with uh... – you know, they're already scheduled to play uh, basketball, and, and Trimble is willing to, to get, you know, not back out on games this year. Uh, now, Odom might say if we can find somebody else, could we? I, I don't know. But they're, they're scheduled to play, so Trimble has said they would they would not leave them high and dry uh, without a ball game. Of course, they just play once. So, But now they could work on an agreement. If, if they worked out something on their own and chose not to and to pick up another team, they could do that. But they have agreed that they would not – they would still – yeah, and I am, I am in no point in favor one way or another, but I just I just was curious why the what what the mentality was, and, and that makes all the sense in the world. I'm I'm an underdog guy myself, but but now I kind of I kind of understand that. Well, I, I, one thing that I would encourage all of you to remember, and we've had a turnover uh, in the board the last couple of years, and sometimes uh, you don't have that institutional memory. Uh, we don't school size factors nothing into any sport except football and track. So and you will hear from people, well, we're, we're, we can't play against this team. We're too small. Unfortunately, what this board is constrained with doing is looking at geographic clusters, period. And that's, that's trouble when your state's not geographic. We don't have a square. So you're going to be dealing with occasionally somebody saying, we haven't beat them in 20 years. We need to move. We need to do this. I can tell you in that district at times, it reminds me of several other districts where it does, you have matchups where it does neither team any good to play that game. So they've worked that out within their seeding plan that we're going to play once, count twice, or we're just not going to play and take the fourth seed, or we're going to do something because it doesn't do anybody any good. 
So I think you'll see a lot of that worked out. This is one that represents what the board said they wanted years ago and it's done since then is if you've got consensus, then you bring it to us. But otherwise, unless you've got a new building, we don't want to talk to you unless you've moved locations because in reality, there's no, the circumstances haven't changed to put you in that alignment. We will have a request in January from, I believe, because I've been talking to them for a couple of years from Jenkins who was moved to the 15th to balance things. And they have requested for about the last year that we consider moving. It's just now finally January when they can get on the agenda. They don't have the sense of urgency, nor do they have the agreement that this district had. I think you could combine one motion and finish this one. And then I think you can move on to the next one that comes down the road. And I'll just say one more thing. Uh, Henry does play Trimble uh, twice. Uh, that they do play all that. So if, if it's okay, you know, I'd like to make that motion that, that we make sure first and foremost that the seating for the Oldham County Schools, they will be allowed as a three team if they choose to just play once in soccer or, or basketball or whatever sport because they will be a three team district. And, and for whatever reason, they just want to play once and that's fine that they not be penalized and they can seed the way they would like to. Um, and, and then the next motion will be that we, you know, move Trimble back to the 31st. Is that an alignment in all sports, Commissioner? Yeah, that yes. would be any other sport that trickles off the basketball alignment. Yes, sir. There's the motion. Do I have a second? Seconded by Mark. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? The only thing to be sure and clarify, they everybody already has the option to only play once, but they didn't have an option on the tiebreaker until you combine these motions. And that's really good, giving more local control. But we are assured that Carol, Eminence, Gallatin, Henry, and Owen are all fine with it. Yes, I, I, I spoke to Henry. I spoke to TJ. There's one. Uh, Linda, what's going on? Uh, Eminence, Gallatin, Henry, uh, Owen. No. Okay. Eminence. There's, uh, there's only one, but. Carol. I'm sorry. There, there was only one that I did not get to speak to personally. But in talking with the AD, the rep from that, uh, you know, said that, that uh, they, they were fine. Sure. Ladies. The motion has been made and seconded. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor of that consideration of the district realignment moving Trimble County to the 31st, signify by raising your right hand. You would ask them to hold. <coughs> if you will hold it. You and don't forget you got Zoom. When we come back, let's just ask ask for no votes and that way we get that on the record. Is there anyone can I get voting you, no? Can I? Is there anyone voting no? We have 10 yay votes in the building. Is there anyone on Zoom voting no? Then you can record it, Mr. Adams. Hearing none. Pardon? Debbie Bleak, you're voting okay. no. I'm sorry. Russ so there will be one no. Russ is a no. Is that correct? Russ is a no. Russell. No, no. Or <laughs> no's. And that's all of the nose. Okay, thank you. 15 to 15 to 2, that motion carries. It was their motion was yeah, starting the motion, with basketball. The motion was starting immediately with basketball. Debbie, are you looking to say something? Yes, yeah. so I think you all look too late. I was voting yes on that and was pulling my hand down, and I think that's what happened. I did not vote no on that last one. I did vote yes. Then it so will be 16, 16 to 1 in favor. Uh, the motion passes 16 to 1. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Is there any other discussion regarding anything that uh, that's been discussed today, or anything else that needs to be brought up? I want to say uh, one. Thing. Have we set our baseball weeks now? Or are they set? Oh, I was going to announce we will take that and put together a, in summary of this meeting because the, the basketball dominoed it down. We still all the discussion was about their week one being spring break week one. Uh, are we still looking at them playing through the end of June? Uh, well, it will be nine weeks plus postseason, correct? So it's not the end of June. It's like the 18th. Am I right? 
Okay. You you basically taking the first two weeks and moving yeah. to the last. We'll two. we'll make sure all of those marry, marry up, but they will start the first of the three spring break weeks and go nine weeks plus postseason. So they get their whole season. Thank you. Julian, one question. Uh, I know it's basketball uh, conversation, conversation, but what about swim wrestling? Do we want to say they, they can, can practice, practice or what, what, what do we want to do? All we're that looking stand? at right now is the state date. I don't think you change much, but, but I'm telling you that saying swimming can practice is only going to allow a few elite programs to practice. But there's no, no reason you, you wouldn't just make it a blanket that okay. you left the spring start or okay. winter sport to start. Thank you. Yeah. That's postseason is to be determined. That was going to be my question. We we were talking about all winter sports when we were. Is that when we made the motion? Were we just talking about basketball starting Monday, or is yeah, that? I think all the winter? only thing that's probably still in the air is what we do with cheer and dance, but that's okay. just more for postseason than it is regular season. Because that that was question. So, with that being said, Russ, I, I need some clarification on. Have we said the amount of games they can play per week in basketball? And with that, is that a nine-week um, ske um, schedule that we've set today? Would that allow them to schedule 27 games? The, the guidance document contains that because that's what was approved as public health. It, it has not been changed. And I, I want to say it's – Three or four. Uh, let me pull it up and make sure. There, that we're I believe it's three, but there's something in there with the average. Uh, maybe yeah. when we, 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 we that. basically play in a tournament where they play over one week and gain it back the next. That would stand. Yeah. Okay. So they're they're going to be able to probably get their whole limit in if they play that average right. Okay. Yeah. I think that we will we will put some stuff out and you know encourage and let's do, don't do this stuff early that kind of deal. Because right. we're all worried about those first two weeks. Everybody's worried about the first two weeks. I've talked to a couple coaches over the last four or five days. Uh, they have intentions within their own districts of just playing a varsity game, yep. not even having a JV game, and maybe rescheduling a JV game for a Saturday afternoon or something to that nature. So, so I think I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised with what our coaches do and how they handle it going forward. So, uh, is there any further discussion? Any other thing that needs to be mentioned, Larry? About middle school. They're still going to follow the same high school. Yeah, it would, it would have the same base if you're playing a winter season. And some played fall. Middle school will follow the, the same predicament as high school if they have a winter season. Yeah, that's what I'll put out because that's we'll – So we'll ready. get some direction from the commissioner over the next We'll get so. more details out. Again, you just well, – by resolving this morning, you kind of – the dominoes can start to fall. So, so Julian, so what, so what we're saying, because I got the same question from Pete Fraley on the game limitations per week. Are we looking at the same thing that we did in volleyball where you have four matches, you basically eight matches in two weeks and you just have the average, the average, correct. is that, is that correct? Yes, okay. that's, okay. that was what's in the, yeah, in the public you. health document. Thank you. Before we get a motion to adjourn, I, I know this is probably one of the most contentious meetings we've had since I've been on this board without question. And there's a variance of opinion. There's a variance of public opinion. There's a variance of governmental opinion. Uh, there's a variance of opinion from coaches from region to region. Uh, I do respect all of those that have a, a difference in opinion, as well as I would hope that they would think they respect those with opposite opinions. Uh, we have been so successful in the four and a half years I've been here of being able to keep one thing in mind, and that's 270 member schools and 84,000 kids. And as long as we continue to do that, and we think we're doing that with the best interest for those kids, is it gonna be right all the time? I don't think so. But at least by moving forward, we're gonna to attempt to make it right. And, and I think we have the wherewithal intelligently, financially, I think we'll make it work. I still contend that we will find a way to make it work. I used the analogy yesterday that I won't use again, but you know we've got a, we've got an arrow in the air. Let's let's now make sure it hits the right target. With that being said, is there any more discussion? If none, I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion from Greg. Do I have a second? Second from Larry. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>